Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level, Biology in 6 for June 2023. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1. The photograph shows cells undergoing mitosis in the roots of an onion plant. So we can see these are the cells going through mitosis and they ask them the stage of mitosis shown in cell X. We can see the chromosomes are moving away, so this is going to be anaphase. Moving on. In part B, they say a student read a scientific report that stated cell division was reduced when plant cells were treated with a caffeine solution. They want you to describe an experiment to measure the mitotic index of cells from onion roots treated with different concentrations of caffeine. Because we are varying the concentration of caffeine, this is going to be the independent variable. So we need to get onions and expose them to the different concentrations and then keep specific variables constant. However, because this is about mitotic index, we have to use hydrochloric acid in order to break down the pectins and acetic osane, which is going to be a good staining agent. So I say it expose onion roots to different concentrations of caffeine solution and include an experiment without caffeine. Then place the root tips in hydrochloric acid to break down the pectins between cell walls. And then wash the acid off with distilled water. Then place the root tips in a vial of a suitable staining agent like acetylcholine for a given period of time. You could also use methylene blue or toluidine blue as staining agents. Then place the onion root tips onto a microscope slide. Then you macerate with a needle and place a cover slip. Then using a microscope, you count the number of all cells in mitosis and then count the total number of cells and calculate the mitotic index by dividing the number of cells in mitosis by the total number of cells. In carrying out this experiment, the root tip should be from the same onion and they should be exposed to different concentrations of caffeine solution for the same period of time. And all solutions should be at the same temperature, which can be controlled using a water bath. Then here they say the scientific report suggested that caffeine affected the production of cell loss molecules needed for cell division. They want you to describe the structure of a cell loss molecule. Cell loss is made up of beta glucose molecules with every other glucose molecule embedded compared to the next in the chain. It also contains only one for glycosidic bonds and cell loss contains straight chains which are not branched. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, the photograph shows part of a desert in Mexico. So we can see this is a desert. We have the mimosa trees and the cactus plants. They say a scientist observed that one species of cactus was often found near a species of tree, mimosa. The scientist decided to test the hypothesis that cactus plants often grow close to mimosa trees. 100 locations were selected at random. This is very important for the results to be considered valid. A 10 by 10 meter quadrat was placed at each location and the presence or absence of each species was recorded in each quadrant. This is just one possible benefit to cactus plants of growing near mimosa trees. If you look at the figure given, the mimosa plants are quite huge and tall, so they can shield the cactus from wind. In part B, suggest one risk that the scientists might encounter when carrying out this investigation and how you would reduce the risk. Because we are working with plants, there could be allergic reactions as well as insect bites. So they have to use appropriate clothing, they have to use gloves as well as boots to prevent all that. Next they say the table shows the results of this investigation. So we see for each plant as well as the quadrats in which the plants were present or absent. Then they say an odds ratio can be used to determine if the presence of mimosa trees has an effect on the presence of the cactus plant. They want you to calculate an odds ratio using the following steps and give your answer to two significant figures. In step one, they say the number of quadrats in which mimosa trees and cactus plants are present divided by the number of quadrats in which mimosa trees are absent by cactus plants are present. So here we can see it's going to be 60 divided by 16 if we are finding the answer to step one. And in step two, the number of quadrats in which mimosa trees are present and cactus trees are absent, this is going to be that. While the number of quadrats in which both mimosa and cactus trees are absent is going to be this, so I wrote a 20. So if our odds ratio is going to be step 1 divided by step 2, it's going to be that divided by that. If this one here is 3.75 and this is going to be 0 0.2, the final answer is going to be that divided by that, 
which gives us an odds ratio of 19 to 1. Or you could say 18.75 to 1. But when I round off to two significant figures, it becomes 19 to 1. The table shows how the odds ratio can be used in this investigation. So here we can see it can be less than 1, equal to 1, or greater than 1, depending on the preference of my most trees. And they ask, give a conclusion that can be made from the results of this investigation. From the investigation, we get a 19, and since a 19 is greater than 1, we can say this is going to increase the likelihood of cactus plants being present. And therefore, my conclusion is the cactus plants are found growing in close proximity with the mimosa trees. In part D, abiotic variables in the soil cannot be controlled in this investigation. However, these variables can be measured to confirm that these plants are growing in similar conditions. State two abiotic variables in the soil that could affect this investigation. There is going to be water content of the soil, pH of the soil, the mineral content or salinity of the soil, the temperature of the soil, and so on. Then here they say, choose one of the variables you have identified in one and state the effect it could have on the results if the measured values were not similar. The variable I chose was temperature, and the effect this could have on the result is the results will not be valid since higher temperature or lower temperature has a way it affects enzymes. A higher temperature causes the enzyme-controlled reactions to be faster, while a lower temperature is going to decrease the rate of reaction. And sometimes if the temperature increases beyond the optimum temperature, then there is going to be denaturation of the enzymes, so the rate of reaction could decrease as well. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. In question three, they say the photograph shows a fruit fly, Drosophila, on the skin of a fruit, which is this one here. The species of fruit fly is endemic to Southeast Asia, but recently it has become an invasive species in Europe. The female lays fat flies eggs under the skin of fruits. The egg hatch into larvae that feed on the fruit, and the larvae develop into pupae that become adult flies. A student investigated the effect of using an organic pesticide, which is pyrethrum, on the hatching of eggs and the development of pupae. 16 flasks containing a culture medium were prepared. 8 flasks had 0.5 grams of pyrethrum added. This is the mass used. And then each flask had one female fly that laid eggs for 24 hours. The fly was then removed and the eggs were allowed to hatch and develop into pupae. Now, when I look at this methodology, we can see they used only one mass, which is 0.5, so there was no variation in the mass. We can also see that the time allowed for the female to lay eggs was 24 hours, so they could have allowed more than that. So this could be sources of errors later on in the question when they ask if these results could be believable or valid. The photograph shows fly pupae in one of the flasks. We can see them here. And they say after five days, the number of pupae in each flask was counted. And then the time we see here is five days, as I mentioned from the previous page. They said the results were, as we can see here. And they want us to state a null hypothesis for this investigation. Because we are comparing two data sets, I say there is no significant difference between the number of pupae from untreated culture A and the number of pupae from untreated culture B. Here they said draw a suitable table to display this data and calculated means for the number of pp from the flask containing the untreated and treated flasks. The key thing in presenting a table, you need to label and include units. So these are the raw results from the previous page of untreated and treated, and the calculated means are 62 and 41. So the total divided by 8 gave me 62, and the total divided by 8 gave me 41. Moving on. Here they say draw a suitable graph to show the mean number of pupae from the untreated culture medium and treated culture medium. They wanted to include an indication of variability, meaning we need to put error bars in this data set. So this is easy. I used my mean value for each. We have a 62 and we have a 41. If I can make it smaller, you can see these are results for untreated and those are results for treated. Again, this graph is going to have units as well as labels on both axes and then choose a suitable scale. If you have your mean, then the lower and the higher value in each section, lower and higher value in each section. For the lower one here, I have 43, higher one 81. As you can see on the previous page, we have 43, and then we have 81. And then the lower one here is going to be 29, and we have the higher one, which is 56. So we can see 29 here and 56 here. That is how the data was presented. 
Next, they say the student analyzed the data with a t-test using the formula, which is this one here, where this is going to be the mean of each value, and n is the number of samples, which was, of course, 8. So to get the t-value, I had to substitute here. If I take the mean of a to be 62 and the mean of b to be 41, this means I'm going to substitute, and then this is going to be that divided by 8 plus that divided by 8, and using my calculator, I got 4.11. Next, they say the table shows the critical values of t for different degrees of freedom. And they also gave us how to calculate the number of degrees of freedom, which is going to be total, which is 8 minus 1. And for total for b was 8 minus 1, giving us a 14. So the degrees of freedom are going to be 14. And in biology, we get the results at p is equal to 0 0.05. So that and that correspond to give me a critical value of 2.14. So here they said it used the conclusion that can be drawn from this investigation, and they want you to use the information in the table to support your answer. From the calculated value, which is 4.11, we see the critical value is 2.14, so this value is greater than that. So the calculated value is greater than the critical value, so we need to reject the null hypothesis, and that means there is a significant difference between the treated and the untreated results. Describe two ways this investigation could be extended to collect more data to either support or reject the hypothesis. This is similar to what I wrote in the beginning of this question. The experiment could have been carried out for longer. The female could have been allowed more than 24 hours to lay eggs to allow more eggs to be collected. And they used a mass of 0.5 grams of pyrethrum, meaning the experiment was not varied enough. They could have used more masses of pyrethrum. The counting was carried out for just five days they could have prolonged the experiment for more than five days. And in part F, pyrethrum is applied to fruit crops growing in fields. Suggest two reasons why applying pyrethrum to fruit crops in fields might not reduce the damage to fruits. It's because pyrethrum is applied on the surface, yet the fruit flies are going to be on the inside, or the pupae are going to be on the inside, so it may not reach them. Also, the concentration or mass used is quite small. It might not be strong enough to destroy them from the outside. And then the pyrethrum could be washed away. So I say pyrethrum may not penetrate into the fruits to affect the eggs. And pyrethrum could be washed off by rain before its intended effect. Also, the mass of pyrethrum used, which is 0.5 grams, could be low to cause high enough effect on the fruit flies, which are found in the inner parts of the fruit. So this brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four, the photograph shows some leaves of piper beetle, a plant that grows in the Philippines and other countries in Southeast Asia. This is the plant. The leaves are eaten as traditional cure for human digestive disorders, and the leaves are thought to prevent the growth of some species of bacteria. A student formed the following hypothesis. The leaves of piper beetle contain antimicrobial compounds that reduce the bacterial growth. They want you to plan an investigation to find the evidence to support or reject this hypothesis. And then your answer should give details under the following headings. Describe preliminary practical work that you would undertake to ensure your proposed method will provide quantitative results. In planning this experiment, we need to find out about the conditions that we're going to use. We need to find out about the method of extraction of the antimicrobial agents. And we need to find out about the suitable method to measure the dependent variable. So I said find a suitable bacterial species, find the suitable medium, the temperature as well as pH for the culture. Then find a suitable method to obtain the antimicrobial extract from the leaves. For example, we need to find which solvent, what mass are we going to use and so on. And then find a suitable method to measure the growth inhibition by the extract. For example, it could be measuring the diameter of the zone of inhibition. Then part B says devise a detailed method, including how you would control and monitor important variables. For this nine mark question, we begin by studying the dependent variable. We begin by talking about antiseptic techniques, how we're going to vary the independent variable, how we're going to measure the dependent variable, the variables that we have to keep constant and how we're going to keep them constant. So I said, the dependent variable is the diameter of the zone of inhibition. So we have to use aseptic techniques like flaming around the workplace and sterile equipment. We have to crush a known mass of leaves from the plant and use the same volume of solvent like distilled water to extract the antimicrobial agents from the leaves. Then we prepare agar plates with a suitable growth medium 
and inoculate it with bacteria. Then cut evenly sized filtered paper discs and place them in the antimicrobial extract for the same period of time. Then using sterile forceps, place the filter paper discs. These are the ones that have already been soaked in the antimicrobial agent. So you put them onto the inoculated agar plates. Then you place the petri dishes into an incubator at 20 degrees for 24 hours. The 20 degrees is to ensure that we culture below human body temperature. And then 24 hours, this could be longer or a little bit shorter. Then we measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition around the disc using a ruler. In this experiment, we'll control the variables like temperature using an incubator, pH using a buffer, and then we'll crush the stem number or mass of leaves. Then repeat the experiment for each extract at similar conditions and then calculate the mean. Then practice says describe how your results should be recorded, presented, and analyzed in order to draw conclusions from your investigation. In this part, we do not need to draw the table or the graph, but you can just write about it and get the same marks. So I say record the results in a suitable table with headings and units and include columns for repeat experiments and a mean. Then you draw a bar graph with labeled axes and units and use a suitable statistical test like the t-test to establish significance. And lastly, they say describe two limitations of your proposed method. Now the proposed method, the measurement of my dependent variable was measuring the diameter of the zone of inhibition this could be difficult to measure the diameter precisely. Also, there is a possibility of contamination because I'm scratching plant material. Some microorganisms could be already present on the leaves of these plants that I'm going to get the extract from. The leaves are eaten, so their antimicrobial effects could be anaerobic, meaning inside the gut, yet I'm trying to work with aerobic bacteria that I'm culturing on the agar plate, so that could also be a source of errors. Then the experiment should be repeated with other bacteria strain in order to establish validity of the results with other bacteria. So this brings us to the end of question four, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.